Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to VBS, our very own virtual broadcasting in Syracuse. Over the next four weeks, we look forward to celebrating our hometown of Syracuse as we connect through fellowship with our crafts and our songs. We also have our puppet friends here to share God's message, as well as special guests from our community to speak about various topics. Our VBS, VBS station is for all ages, and we hope to bring you joy as we embrace God's word. As I mentioned in church this past Sunday, our town has a published book called For the Record, A Centennial History of Syracuse. It's copyrighted in 1972 and was written by Margaret Masters. This is the book right here. So it's one of our foundational books for our VBS curriculum over the next four weeks. Um, she dedicated this book to all who have called Syracuse their hometown. Special thanks to our city librarian, Sue Antis, for sharing this treasured book with me in honor of our 2020 VBS theme. So I want to give you a couple of hints of Syracuse, which we'll be talking about here shortly. How horses served as a major industry for the town of Syracuse. The naming of our town. We'll talk about the fairgrounds and our racetrack. Also talk about Dr. Hill, who was a dentist with a unique patent. The connection with our sister city, Syracuse, New York, and how our pool came to life. Now, kids, if you haven't already done so, be sure to put on your lanyards. Pastor, demonstrate there. Pastor Sarah, Larry has one, Carrie. All our friends here have their lanyards. So put your name on your lanyard and decorate it any way you want to. There were stickers that came in your craft kits, but we want to feel like VBS at home. So without further ado, I know our puppets are anxiously awaiting Pastor Sarah. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Right. Before our puppets start, we're going to do a prayer, just giving thanks to God for the gift of getting to be together. We know we don't get to all gather in this space, but celebrating our hometown, we know that we have the gift of being connected together, seeing each other around our community, and getting to celebrate who we are through the Holy Spirit gathering us. We're so thankful for Lacey, for Carrie, for the kids, for Larry, our puppeteers. So let's say a prayer as we enter into taking care of this good hometown. Gracious God, we thank you that you have taught us the gift of taking care of your creation. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to learn in this time of VBS every Wednesday throughout this month of June. Bless us as we learn about how you have called us to take care of your beautiful creation, each other, the animals, the land, the very gifts that we have with each other. Bless us as we learn about our hometown and as we learn about you. And all of God's people say, Amen. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Rocket and Lydia, who are going to share with us the wonderful Bible story where God tells us about, well, how we learn about God creating everything and how God then asks the human beings that God creates to take care of it all. Looking up at this night sky, I feel so small. Have you ever wondered how it all got here? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, covered in water. We don't have to wonder. In the Bible, God has told us exactly how it all got there. Really? How come nobody's ever told me that before? On the first day, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God separated the day and the night. So, you mean God created the sun? Not yet, actually. God doesn't do that for three more days. So, how did God make the light? Well, God just spoke into existence. It's like God turned on the light switch until the sun got warmed up. Hmm. But God was just getting started. On day two, God created our atmosphere. Well, what did God do that 
for? So we could breathe, silly. What did God do next? I'm glad you asked. The next day, God separated the waters from the dry land, and the earth took form. Wow! You mean that's when God created the oceans and the mountains? Yep, that's what the Bible says. What next? What next? Wait, don't tell me. God made people. No, God doesn't do that for three more days. On the third day, God made the grass and the trees, fruits, and vegetables. Like broccoli? I wish God hadn't thought of that. Check this out. On the fourth day, God placed the sun, moon, and stars in the sky. Well, how did God do that in one day? Is that even possible? According to the Bible, sun, moon, stars, one day. I don't know how God did it, but when I get to heaven, I'm sure going to ask him. What next? How does God top that? On day five, God made all the birds of the earth and all the sea creatures. I saw a weird-looking crab once in a fish tank. Did he make that? Yes. How about sharks with those giant scary looking teeth? Did God make those? Uh-huh. How about sea monsters? According to the Bible, yes, even sea monsters. That's crazy awesome, dude. You are absolutely blowing my mind. Finally, on the sixth day, God populates with the earth with all the animals. Wow, kids, Lydia was just telling me about how God created the whole world. And everything in it. Let's see. First, God for God created the earth. Then God turned on the lights. Then God made our atmosphere so we could breathe. Then God formed the oceans and the land. Then God made trees and broccoli. Then God put up the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then God made all the animals. And most importantly, God made people. The Bible says God created man in God's own image and gave him domain, dominion over the whole earth and everything in it. Mm, dominion sounds like trouble. It's not trouble, Rocket. It is amazing. God loves having us people so much that God wants us to be part of God's amazing creation. That means God puts us in charge of taking care of the earth, taking care of the animals, and taking care of each other. That sounds like hard work. It is, but gives us help every day. God sends God's only son, Jesus, to show us how to love the world and take good care of it. And God gave us each other so we could work together. Lydia? Yes, Rocket? I'm so thankful God created you so that I could work together with you to love and take care of the world. Aw. Uh, and you know what, Rocket? God gave you all these kids to be with you, too. Let's ask these kids to pray with us so we can get to work. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For showing us how. For showing us how. To love and take care. To love and take care. Of the world you made. Of the world you made. Forgive us when we fail. Forgive us when we fail. And lead us. And lead us to try again. To try again. Amen. Amen. Hey, Rocket, I got a question for you. What? So I hate mice. Carrie, do you like mice? No, Carrie Schroeder and I absolutely can't stand mice. But what you said, you said God created all creatures, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So that's one of the questions I'm going to ask God about when I go to heaven. Why... Did you create mice? Okay, thank you for that reminder, Rocket. Okay, without further ado, we have one of our special guests here, Sam Cordry. And tonight, Sam is going to share with us her pet bunny named Coco. And as we just talked about, God, he wanted us to take care of all our animals and um, everything that we do with, um, whether it be pets or livestock. So I just wanted to ask Sam a couple questions because I really don't know how to take care of a bunny. And so I'm just going to lean on her for her expertise. So Sam, what is your bunny's name? Coco. Coco? Okay. And is she a boy or a girl? <laughs> that was a trick question. 
How old is Coco? She has four months. Four months, okay. Um, what does Coco eat? She eats grass and some pellets. Grass and pellets, okay. So do they eat carrots by chance? Um, well, carrots are actually kind of like ice cream for them. They're actually made of more sugar that they can't really have often. Interesting. You always see a bunny with carrots, so that's probably why. Okay. And my last question, Sam, is how do you take care of a bunny? Well, every day I have to give her m more water, pellets, and more grass, and then I have to clean her cage every day. Do you hold her and love her? Yes. Okay. Okay. I can tell. She definitely loves you. She's definitely comfortable with you, Sam. So, okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your bunny and and sharing her. Um, she's been a great joy. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Who's ready for a song? I am. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Carrie Schroeder's here, our musical guru, and she's going to go ahead and take care of us with some music. Hello? Oh, okay. This is, called, this is called The Creation Song, and it goes to a very familiar tune, which I'm sure that you'll pick up on as we start singing. So go ahead and sing along with me as you get used to the tune, and you can see the words on the screen. Here we go. God created, God created night and day. Carrie, thank you kids. Lance, next time you're gonna have to join us. <laughs> okay, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Okay, with us tonight is a very familiar face, Larry Bartels. I'm gonna get a stool here, sit down on. Okay, so tonight we have our special guest, Larry Bartels. Larry and his daughter, Jennifer Bartels, are longtime, lifetime members of Luther Memorial Church. They've lived in Syracuse their whole life, and so it is our honor to have Larry with us tonight to join in our VBS session as we talk about the history of our hometown and getting to know uh, more about our community and our church. So, um, Larry, one of the questions I had for you 
was can you kind of tell me about why Luther Memorial was established? Well, it started in the 1910, 19, 14, 15 era. The young people in the other, in the Lutheran Church in Syracuse, which was located in what is now the museum, okay. if you know. Uh, they wanted their children taught in Sunday school in English. At that time, they were still teaching them in German. And so they uh, went, but the elders of the church uh, would not change their mind. So they decided uh, they would just start their own church where their children would be taught in English instead of in German for Bible school, Sunday school confirmation. Okay. And uh, so they did so, hired a pastor named Krebs, a, a young pastor. So this was basically, for the most part, uh, young young married people that started this congregation in sort of a, a protest because their elders would not change their ways. Interesting. Okay, so basically what happened then was they taught the kids in German and these families said, you know, we want you to learn in Sunday school in English. Yes. And so that's why they branched off right. and they started Luther Memorial. And guess what we speak today? <laughs> we all speak English here, don't we? But that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. There. Yeah, one of the interesting aspects that happened, if you r realize the time in 1914, you know, the beginnings of what became World War I happened. And so we had the Allied forces in Europe. The United States was yet not involved in World War I, but Europe was fighting uh, with the British and the French and the Allied forces against uh, uh, Germany and the countries involved, eventually all of Europe. And by 1917, the United States became involved. But because of World War I, you can see that there was uh, an effort by more Americans to show they were more American, you know, instead of even though they were of German descent, uh, to show against the war. So as a result, more and more people wanted English spoken instead of German, which they were more comfortable with, particularly the original imports. And so the church grew in leaps and bounds. Uh, it more than doubled in just a few years. And consequently, the first building that was built, which, by the way, is still in this town, the, the original church is what is the now the apartment building one block down the street west of uh, the current elementary school. Okay. And if you will notice, there's one thing unusual about that building. It sticks very far out, very close to the street, uh, particularly on the, uh, on the north side, you know, out right, right out to the edge of the sidewalk. And there's a reason for that, because when the congregation doubled in size, the church was no longer big enough, even though it was only a few years old. So you have to think about the time. There's no power tools. There's no uh, uh, equipment that we are used to today. They had to make the church bigger, and they made it bigger by jacking it up, cutting it in two, digging a basement on the north and the south, about 10 foot each way, pulling the church apart with, uh, you know, horsepower on rollers. Literally with horses, right? Yes, literally yeah. with horses and mules, I, I, I assume, yeah. and putting a new metal in so they gained about uh, 20 foot of more pew space in that church. So, Larry, when did they actually build this church that we have now? Around 1950, uh, it, it was started. Uh, I think the cornerstone is 51, if I remember right. I have an interesting tale about that as being a, 
a small child in, well, not, I was in bi uh, Bible school, summer Bible school. And when it was decided to build this church on this location, the then pastor, Pastor Hefner, was very excited about that. You know, it was good news that the decision had finally been made and this church was going to be built up here. And as a, a 10, 11 year old kid, you know, anytime you didn't, you got some time out of Bible school, you always remembered that. No, Larry. <laughs> we got to walk from <laughs> that church across, now this was wilderness coming from where I'm talking about, there was nothing except farm ground, uh, and, uh, and most of it was just wilderness. There was a pond here. Called, uh, between here and Highway 50, there was no streets. Okay, it was all trees and yes. farm ground. And, and from the creek, creek that's at the bottom of the hill, up this way, the only street that was going was Midland Street, and then Mohawk on the other side. And when you got up this far, you were basically already out of town. Oh, wow. This was a, a park, uh, and it had a, an old bandstand on it, this square block here that the church bought to put this church on. So he brought us up to show us where the church was going to be, walked us through that and back that day. That was our Bible school. So that was a day you probably will never forget in right. your history of your church. Right. Oh, great. And so it, how long did it take to build the church? Do you remember? Oh, no, not really. I mean, it was from, from the time the, it was began, it, a year, oh, basically a year. It okay. wasn't that bad in 1950. Now, Larry, I have another question for you. You mentioned earlier about the Oregon Trail and how Syracuse was involved with that. Can you yes. kind of talk about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, the location, the fact that Sy Syracuse is here, probably has to do with when people were going west and they got off in the Nebraska City and, uh, and took a wagon train west from here. It was, this was on the Oregon Trail. And the Oregon Trail would people would travel by wagon approximately 20 miles a day. That was a full day's journey. So this was one day's journey out of Nebraska City with people going west. Uh, and the original location was not right here. The, if you go down to where today's ballparks are and go west out of Syracuse and where you cross the Namaha there at that bridge, right on the other side of that bridge you will see a long driveway going to the south, and right on the other side of that driveway, you will see a historical marker that for a place called Nursery Hill. That, that's where they actually stopped. Uh, that was the beginning of Syracuse. And so that area had a lot of water then. Yes, because of the river. They, they would always the stop where they had water. And that makes sense. Okay, yeah. so kids, can you imagine being in a covered wagon going from Nebraska City to Syracuse, and it, t it takes you all day long, all day long, just to get here. Right. Wow, Isn't, and, and that's incredible to think about, especially when today we hop on a plane and we can be in across the country just like that. So it's incredible to think about those things and, and thinking about what they did. One of the interesting aspects when you think, if you go out that road and to, to where that bridge is across the Namaha now, the river is very deep there. The banks are like 30 foot deep. At that time, it was just a small creek you could dri drive across with a team and wagon. So uh, there was no big deal crossing the, the name the of the river Hall. then. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is interesting. Well, Larry and I could talk all night probably very easily. Um, but Larry, thank you so much for that information. We might have you back again. If that works for you. Okay. You've been great. So thank you so much for your time and for all that information about our church and our town. Um, definitely some good information that I know I didn't know about. So, okay. okay. Happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to do our craft, boys and girls. So could my crew come up here?
want to go get your supplies? So what we're going to make, they're called sun catchers. And this is an example of what we're going to make. And in your craft kits, I did send home some fake flowers and just some fake twigs. And that was so that I wouldn't send home bugs because we don't want extra critters in your bags. So um, you have those supplies. But what I would encourage you to do is to go outside, enjoy the beautiful weather, pick up some sticks that might work, a stick about this size, or look, pick up some flowers. So Brandy, Taylor, and Caden, they all brought some beautiful flowers. Caden got a dandelion and Taylor got some pretty pink flowers here. So we have all kinds of neat things that we can use. So what we'll do is, okay, kids, you want to go ahead and pull apart your contact paper. Kate, and I'll help you out if you... Thank you, Carrie. Okay, good job. Okay, so this is the fun part. The hard part was just trying to get that contact paper off. But what you can do now, and if you guys want to go ahead, put your flowers on here. Kate and I got some in here too. Got some grasses. So you can just make all kinds of fun fun things here. What we'll do is we'll get our flowers on here, just like Caden and Taylor and Brandy are doing. They're just kind of setting them there on there. And then what we'll ultimately do is fold over that contact paper so we can make this awesome sun catcher. We've got some really pretty flower, pretty colors here too. Brandy, are you done? Okay. You guys can keep doing that. We'll get Brandy's going here. find all your flowers. Nice. Okay. I love it. I love it. And what I really like, like Caden's here, it's a full flower. And you can see that. That looks awesome. So then what we can do is we can put some holes in, in the top there, put your string through, and then your stick. And then there you go. You can hang it up. 
So we'll, we'll do that. Um, but go ahead and hold them up high. Looks great. Okay. Thank you so much. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to do our next song with Carrie. Okay. Oh, this song is called With My Whole Heart. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, next thing we're going to do, Brandy, if you want to go get the food, we're going to do our food craft. We're Lutherans. We love our food, so that's what we do. We seem to have forgotten the bread, and that's okay. <laughs> but what we'll do is, if you're at home, um, you'll take a piece of bread, and you can use Nutella or peanut butter to cover that bread. Um, what's that? Well, what we'll do is we'll probably just wait to do this next week. I apologize. I messed up. <sighs> I forgot the bread, so that's okay. So, Brandy, if you want to go ahead and put this away, we'll just go ahead and move on to our next next object. So, thank you, boys and girls, for helping out, Caden, Taylor, and Brandy. I really appreciate it. Sorry about that, guys. You can go sit down. Okay, go ahead and sit down. Go ahead and sit down. Before we close, I do want to read a couple things out of our book of Syracuse. Um, just some really interesting facts that we talked about earlier when I said that um, we had some hints and tips about Syracuse. So I'm going to go ahead and pull those out right now. 
So as Larry mentioned, the first part of Syracuse was actually um, started west of town. It wasn't quite in town, but it was just west of town. So that was something that I, didn't, I myself didn't know about. And the name of Syracuse is kind of interesting. There was a girl named Amelia Andrews, and she was the daughter of a farmer. His name was Edwin Andrews. He owned a lot of farm ground north of town. She was a teacher in the old school in the southeast corner. And in the winter of 1872, she thought, you know, the name Syracuse would be good in honor of her hometown, her birthplace of Syracuse, New York. So a lot of us hear about Syracuse, New York. That's kind of her connection. So that's where that name came about. I also wanted to talk about horses. I had no idea how important horses were to our community of Syracuse so many, many years ago. So by the middle of the, the 1870s, so not 1970s, 1870s, we're going back a ways, um, horses were an extremely important part of our society. And during that period, there were two barns with rigs that farmers could use to hire for horses within town. So you could use those horses to do some plowing or whatever it might be. But it was a big deal in Syracuse at that time. And the Odo County Fairgrounds was, you know, south of town here. And it was interesting because south of town, they actually had racetrack horse, racetracks for uh, race horses. So um, there were four days, they called it the Odo County um, Fair, and it was held in September 1892. So there were four days of harness racing in June with a winning of $4,500 and an additional three days of racing during the fair that September with a winning of $3,100. Each day's activities were opened with a parade. The dignitaries would come first. The band rode in a circus carriage and then um, they would have these, hor these horse races. So these horse races attracted scores of people from as far away as New York and the West Coast. So isn't that pretty amazing? People from all over the country came to our town to watch these race horses. As many as 150 horses were stabled and trained here during the winter. In 1892, there were 149 entries for the first day of racing. The Fremont Eye, which was a newspaper at the time, they reported that, quote, little Syracuse, which with her kite-shaped trike and other first-class accommodations, is fast becoming the independence of Nebraska. So we made the, the landmark. It was a big, big deal. We were the heart of these racehorses, so that's pretty incredible. Um, another interesting fact, we had a pretty incredible dentist. His name was Dr. Hill. And Dr. Hill was one of the first dentists in Syracuse. And before his time, doctors would pull teeth that had to be removed. We didn't have cavity fillings or root canals or anything like that. They just went ahead and pulled him. And with his office, he had great lighting so he could do additional work that other dentists typically didn't do at that time. He made all his bridges and dentures, and he patented a dental bridge lock, which he made and shipped as far as London. Isn't that amazing? We had a dentist in Syracuse, Nebraska, who worked on our individual's teeth, and then he made something as cool that got shipped all the way to London. So that was pretty amazing. So as I talked about horses, um, there was an unusual horse business which was started by a man named Warren Andrews. So he and his brother Ted, they went to Colorado about 1885, and there they found herds of wild horses. In the winter, they would drive these horses into a corral and break them to the halter, so that way that those horses could be led. Then they would ship these horses to Syracuse, Nebraska, where they could be well broken. So apparently in Syracuse, we were very good at breaking horses. Robert Melvin, their cousin in New York, would travel to Syracuse, Nebraska to buy these well-broken horses and ship them back to Syracuse, New York. Again, that's that connection with our sister city in New York. 
When War and Andrew returned to Syracuse in 1898, the business was continued with local horses. So Melvin, he would come to Syracuse once a year, and he would buy the best horses to bring back to, um, back to New York. And finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about, something that I was really thinking about today in the 93 degrees of, of the heat, was our swimming pool. So we know we're having a new swimming pool built, but where did our first swimming pool, what, what's the history behind that? So one of the needs of the community, most often mentioned by the younger people, in the 1955 survey was a swimming pool. In July of 1957, Don Thompson headed a committee that asked the city council to hold a special election for a bond issue. It was set for the 16th of August in hot weather so that people would feel the need of a swimming pool. However, when the vote was counted, there was a majority in favor, but not the necessary 60%. On a second try, both sides hauled voters in to polls with the result that the $45,000 bond issue was approved. Dr. Williams donated eight acres for the pool in the park. The facilities were open to the public in 1961. And that is the history of our swimming pool. So it started back in 1961, so that's pretty amazing. So with that being said, um, we look forward. Let me see here, where am I at? in my notes here. We hope that you have enjoyed our first episode of VBS, Virtual Broadcasting in Syracuse. Again, I want to thank all our special guests tonight, the Cordry Kids, Nathaniel and Sam, Coco the Bunny, Caden and Taylor Grippenstraw, Brandy Johnson, Carrie Schroeder with her musical talents, and then of course Pastor Sarah and Nick. So um, we look forward to having our second episode next week. So again, tune into VBS at that time. So with that, we'll go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this time together. As we celebrate as a community, We are so grateful for the people and everything that our town provides. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone.